Well, if you have your Bible, turn with me this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll be in 2 Timothy chapter 2. As you're turning there this morning, we're beginning a series over the next few weeks that I like to call the I series, looking at what we are to do as Christians. Now, this isn't a series about what I believe or about what we are in Christ, although I've done series like that and, and uh, would encourage you to look back at some of the previous sermons for what we believe at this church and who we are and where we stand if we are in Christ. No, but this series specifically, the I series, is intended to answer the question, what am I to do? What am I supposed to be doing? What action am I to take? And so this morning, we're going to begin by looking at I disciple. We should be discipling others and being discipled. We're going to look at I worship, I serve, I stand, and I love. And so as we go through the next few weeks at what we are to be doing as believers, I hope that it will remind us that our faith is not just one that is about reading the Bible and praying and attending church, but it's a faith of action. It's a faith that causes us to do something. So this morning, we're going to begin by looking at I disciple. I disciple. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And we'll be there in just a moment. If you you turn there, we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. So we look at this word discipleship. We realize that discipleship is a requirement in Scripture. It is not a suggestion. It is a command. As a matter of fact, the Great Commission... What we often quote as the most evangelistic verse in the Bible tells us not just to go and evangelize, but to go and disciple. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. So we are commanded in Scripture, go and make disciples. What is a disciple? What does that mean to go and make disciples? Disciples. We tend to think of disciples in two ways. The first is we tend to think of a disciple as someone who is a follower of Christ. Like, like the 12 men who followed Jesus while he was on earth. They were his 12 disciples. It also talks about there being a larger group of maybe 72 disciples that were close with Jesus. And in an even larger group, there were hundreds, sometimes thousands of people that followed Christ who were casually labeled as his disciples. Someone who is learning under Jesus. And in that sense, you and I, if we are in Christ, are disciples of Christ. There's a second way that we need to look at this word disciple and discipleship, and that is someone who is learning, spiritually learning, from another individual person. That is, a disciple of Jesus Christ ought to also be a disciple of someone else. They ought to be be learning and growing from other people as well. This second type of discipleship is what I want to look at and focus on today. One of the most famous examples of individual discipleship occurred between a man named Paul, who is the author of many New Testament books, and his disciple Timothy. As a matter of fact, there are two books in the New Testament that are letters from Paul to Timothy and are, in fact, a, an expansion of their mentor-disciple relationship. And so our text this morning, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we're going to see Paul encouraging Timothy to take what he's learned as a disciple and then to go and disciple others. Our key text this morning, read with me in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul is writing to his disciple, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have learned, or what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul says, here's what I want you to do, Timothy. You have spent several years following me, learning everything that that I can teach you about faith in Christ. And now I want you to take what you have heard, what you have learned, and I want you to go find some other individuals who you can teach that to, so that, again, this last line, then they can teach others as well, and it can continue being taught from generation to generation. 
It's this idea that you should always be looking for someone to teach and to disciple with the purpose that they will then take it and teach and disciple someone else. This is the type of discipleship Jesus had in mind all along. We were created to be in community with others. From the very beginning in Genesis, we see that man is created to be with other people. We are created to have relationships with individuals, friendships and and romantic relationships and, and family relationships and acquaintances. We are created to be individuals who are around other individuals. And that's why we find in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, a verse that says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls... His companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. We're created to have relationships with others. We are not intended to be a one-man island, a one-woman island. God wants us to have relationships, to be teaching others. God wants us to be being taught. He wants us to have relationships community. And so this morning, as we think about our first I in our I series, we need to be asking ourselves, what are we supposed to be doing in discipleship? I'll go ahead and tell you the application this morning. I believe every Christian ought to either be discipled by someone else or be discipling someone else, or maybe, and ideally, both at the same time. Every Christian ought to be discipling someone or being discipled by someone, and maybe both at the same time. It's a command in Scripture. It's part of who we are and how we're created. We are called to be in community. We're called to teach others. We're called to grow, and so we have this command to disciple. Now, how does that flesh out in the church? Let me tell you the secret of how that fleshes out in the church. Are you ready? Thus far, it doesn't. Our churches, and I don't mean First Baptist Church, although it certainly applies here, our churches in general do a poor job of discipleship. And I have a theory on why that is. Because it was never intended for a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, or a deacon to do all the discipling in a church. Most churches have decided, we want a discipleship class. Give me one person who can teach 20 people in discipleship. And the Bible is telling us that's not the ideal way to disciple. The ideal way to disciple is you, as an individual, learning from another individual and teaching someone else. It's a one-on-one relationship that the Bible wants us to have. Now, our discipleship class is important. They're wonderful. They're great. And I'm going to give you some resources at the end of this message on how you can personally have some time of growth. Discipleship classes are wonderful, but it's, it's not fulfilling what Paul was telling Timothy. Paul didn't say, go find you a good church that you can be a good Sunday school teacher in and go teach as many people as you can. Paul said, find a few faithful men. And everything you've learned from me, you teach those individuals, those one-on-one relationships. This is a very hard and messy task. It's not something that we easily can begin. It's not something we easily carry out because it requires a lot of time and a lot of investment. It's easy to show up on Sunday morning for a couple of hours. Most of the time it's easy to show up on Sunday morning for a couple of hours. We can kind of sit and be comfortable and we can hear a message. We can hear a Sunday school lesson. We may even be able to come midweek and have a a time of prayer together and and hear a, a devotion or a Bible study of some sort. Those things are easy. But when it takes you making time on a Monday or a Friday or a Saturday or an evening or a morning, when it takes time for you to carve something out that is just being you and one other person, it it feels like a burden. I mean, it seems like a waste. Wouldn't it be so much better if we could if we could reach twenty people instead of this one on one? So I believe Scripture wants us to have one-on-one discipleship. It commands us to make disciples. And I believe that there are specific benefits that God gives us when we are discipling in the way Scripture calls us to disciple. I want to look this morning briefly at five benefits of this type of personal one-on-one discipleship. And I hope that it opens our minds to ask ourselves a question, who am I being discipled by? Or, who am I discipling? 
Maybe we'll ask the question in our own lives, am I carrying out what the command in Scripture is? So five brief benefits of a discipleship relationship. The first is this, discipleship draws out the Word of God. Discipleship draws out the Word of God. How many of you all read your Bible occasionally? Let's just, a quick show of hands, occasionally I read the Bible. Maybe not every single day, maybe not, but occasionally I read it. Okay, most of us, some of you are too nervous to raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're too nervous to raise your hand in here this morning. That way we can see and balance it out. Nobody in here? Okay. Most of us read it occasionally. Most of us draw a little bit out of it here and there. We, we kind of open it up when it's convenient for us. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but ask yourself, How many of you are even faithful enough to read the Word of God on a semi-regular basis? We'll say almost every day. Now, don't raise your hand, but think. Some of you will say almost every day I do. How many of you all then say, I take it to the next level. I do a study, a devotion in the Word of God without fail every single day. Don't raise your hand. Just think to yourself. You know, some of you even teach the Word of God on a regular basis. Some of you even go a step farther and will go in ministry one day and will be proclaiming the Word of God from a a pulpit. We'll be sharing it with, with dozens, maybe hundreds, maybe even thousands of people. Some of you will be great theologians or missionaries or or carrying the word out and you'll be getting all of this from the Bible. My point in all this is to say we are all on different levels of where we're at in studying and learning the Scripture. But I promise you, Whether you are, I occasionally read it when it's convenient for me, or whether you are, I proclaim it on a regular basis, you are not getting out of the Bible what you will until you disciple someone or are being discipled. We find in Scripture this unique principle that God has given us His Word and it is complete and it is fully authoritative. We have everything that we could possibly need contained in the Word of God. But it is brought out to us. It is explained to us fully when we sit down with someone else and are able to talk through what scriptures are saying. That's why in Proverbs 27, 17, we read this principle. Iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Now there are literally hundreds of verses about how important the word of God is and it absolutely is. You can sit down by yourself and study the Bible and get a lot out of it. Really, everything you need. But when we sit down and discuss the Bible with another individual, we start to learn things that didn't occur to us before. I love our Wednesday night times where we're we're doing Bible study together because often we'll open it up to question and answer or someone will will just say, well, this is what what I got from reading that passage of Scripture. Have you ever thought? And, And I love it because... More often than than I would think of or or have cared to realize, I go, I've never thought about it that way before. That's interesting. I'm going to have to to explore that a little bit. I've never interpreted that verse that way, and that could be, well, that could really be impactful in my life. There are times I sit down with someone I'm discipling, and I'm blessed that we have new believers in this church that I get to be involved in discipleship, that they come and they ask questions. Well, what does this verse really mean? And sometimes I'm on it. Let me share with you exactly what this verse means. Other times I go, you know, I have no idea. (laughs) I don't know. It causes us to go back and start studying and start digging in and start reading the Word of God. Discipleship does that. It draws out the Word of God for us. It sharpens us. And it takes our study of the Bible to another level. Secondly, discipleship not only draws out the Word of God, another benefit is that discipleship builds humility. Discipleship builds humility. It is a great temptation for us to think the best of ourselves. You know, we, we like to build ourselves up. And the truth is, we like to think we know ourselves better than anyone else knows us. I mean, we're with us all the time. But Scripture says that we might actually be more confused than we think. Jeremiah says our heart is deceitful above all else. Our heart will play tricks on us. Our heart will tell us things are okay when they're not. Our heart will cause us to be comfortable and content. Wise counsel from a friend. Wise counsel from a a mentor. Wise counsel from another individual could be just the thing God uses to bring humility into your life. 
Proverbs says that a wise man will hear and will learn and acquire wise counsel in Proverbs 1.5. And we can safely assume that an unwise man then will not hear from others, will shut them down and not listen, and will push them away. Someone who is full of pride doesn't want the advice of others. Someone who is humble says, tell me what I can correct. We need to resist the temptation to be wise in our own eyes. Proverbs 3, 7 says, Don't consider yourself to be wise. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Boy, this isn't so easy. We like to think of ourselves as pretty smart, as pretty wise, as pretty together. We have it figured out. We know what's going on. The Bible says you need other people in your life to help point out when things aren't going exactly the way God wants them to. To go. Discipleship builds this type of humility in our life that forces us to ask ourselves questions that we wouldn't ask on our own. It allows other people to be involved in our lives, which leads us to the third benefit. Discipleship unites us with fellow believers. You know, the number one complaint I hear from people who end up dropping out of the church or leaving the church, you know what I hear over and over time and time again. I always hear something along the lines of, I just didn't feel connected to the church. When people stop going to church, their their mantra is, I didn't feel close. I didn't feel like I, I had relationships with people. I felt distant or I felt separated or apart. I didn't feel like I had that community that I would expect a church to have. And the truth is, the more a church grows, the more this disconnect becomes apparent. The larger a church grows, the harder it is to have community with everyone in the church. That's why I I pray for, already I pray for, our future growth here at First Baptist Church. We've had, over the last month, um, really probably, I'd say, record highs since I've been here, in attendance over the last month. I've been excited to see our numbers steadily grow. It's been a wonderful time to see how God is bringing different people into the church. We've had salvations. We've had, we've had individuals who are professing faith in Christ, others who are rededicating, others who are plugging into ministry. It's been great. And I hope that there's a vision one day that this entire sanctuary is overflowing with people. We have to have seven services just to minister to everybody, right? And we've, we're going to have it on screens down in the fellowship hall. And we're going to be busting at the seams. And in that point, in that time, We will have people who leave the church because it's too big and they don't feel connected. They can't can't connect with other believers. Already some of you are sweating and are a little nervous. If we got so big and I couldn't know everybody, boy, my, my small church wouldn't be the same anymore. Do you know how you overcome that? How you continue to pray, Lord, bless us and see people come to Christ and see growth in our church without us losing that closeness. We do that through discipleship. You build relationships with individuals. You're investing in people's lives, not just a class or a worship service. We are required as believers to invest in each other. And there will come a time, and maybe is getting close to that time, where we are having and forcing ourselves to invest one-on-one. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another. Build each other up, as you're already doing. Discipleship is a time for us to, to be encouraging with individuals. I can take time every Sunday morning and call out people who are special in this church and are doing a wonderful job. And honestly, I don't have time every Sunday to call out all the people that are serving in our church because there are so many of you who are already so much of a blessing to us. But wouldn't it be nice if we were doing that to each other? If in this one-on-one relationship we could look and we could say, you as a fellow believer in Christ, I'm thankful for your ministry. You as an individual who is new in the faith, I'm thankful for your growth. You as an individual who who have been coming for years and years and years, I'm thankful for your faithfulness. We ought to be investing one-on-one with other believers so that we can have that closeness and that community. And another benefit that that brings when that happens, and one that I'm learning oh so clearly over the last several weeks, is that discipleship reminds us of the Christian struggle. Discipleship reminds us 
of the Christian struggle. I, I do want a brief show of hands in here because this will single out some, not single out. There'll be a, a big group of you. How many of you in here have been a, a member of this church for at least 10 years? A member of this church for at least 10 years. You're looking around and there's about half of the congregation in here who has been a member of this church for at least 10 years. How many of you say, I have been a believer in Jesus Christ for at least 10 years? A believer in Jesus Christ for at least 10 years. All right? Some of you aren't even 10 years old yet. You got your hands up. But you were born, right? Born in church. That's wonderful. You know, we get complacent as Christians. It's really easy when we've been a Christian for any length of time to start, start thinking we've got this Christian thing figured out. It's Sunday morning. It's Sunday school. It's, it's Wednesday night occasionally. It's helping with Bible school. It's, it's getting involved with different projects. And, and we get comfortable and complacent. Many in here, and I won't say all, but there are many in here who are also comfortable in their, in their personal state, in their financial state, in their job state, in their living state. We're very comfortable where we're at. The Lord has blessed you, and, and we're thankful for how God has blessed you. Many in here are so comfortable with, with their relationship with God and their, their status quo of Christianity that we forget that the Christian life is not an easy life. You've had ups and downs because you've been a believer for 10 years, maybe longer, maybe 20 or 30 years. And you've seen God is faithful in the difficult times. You've seen God pull you up in the struggles. And you've seen how God continues to hold fast to you. But you forget there are others who have not experienced that faith quite yet. They're new in their relationship with the Lord. They want to believe that God will pull them through. But they're just not sure. It's, it's hard for them. They're battling an addiction that you're not battling. They have something that they want to let go of that they, they can't let go of. They're trying as they may. They're praying, Lord, take it from me. And they're still struggling with the same sin or the same temptation. They're not able to pay their bills and they're tithing. Or they're trying to tithe. They're giving what they can and they see the offering plate go by every single week, and they keep hearing, God will be faithful to me if I give. But, but after two months of giving, they're still struggling to pay their bills. They're making ends meet, but just barely. And they're wondering, God, I thought you promised that you were going to take care of me. I thought you promised that you were going to help me. You see, as, as mature Christians, we often get complacent with our faith. Lord, we've seen you do it before. We'll see you do it again. This is hard, but I've got my faith and I'm going to push through. When you start to disciple people, you start to realize that most of us have struggles that we don't share with everyone. Most of us have a temptation. Most of us have a, a burden. Most of us are carrying something that, that we're too afraid to reveal to someone else. That one-on-one -on -one relationship, that discipleship reminds us that Christianity is sometimes messy. It's hard. It's not meant to be a cakewalk. That's why we have discipleship. Galatians 6.22 commands us to carry one another's burdens. And in this way, we fulfill the law of Christ. You know what happens in discipleship? You start learning about people's real needs and you can pray for them in specific ways. You can help them in tangible ways. You can realize they struggle with an addiction and you can be an accountability partner for them. You can continually ask them, how are you doing in overcoming that? You can know that they have a certain temptation that they cannot overcome and you can be praying for them and encouraging them in that temptation. You can see a, a tangible need, maybe it's financial or maybe it's, it's physical and you can be involved in helping them with their tangible need. See, discipleship reminds us that Christianity is not meant to be lived in a bubble and it's not meant to be easy. Christianity is a fight and a daily struggle. Many of us have forgot that. I promise you, if you spend just an hour a week with a new believer, just one hour a week for, with a new believer, you're going to learn really quick and be reminded really quickly how difficult life can be we disciple others because we need that humility and we need to be able to tangibly meet people where they're at. And then finally, discipleship equips us for faithfulness. How do we grow in our faith? We read the Bible and we pray. We come to church. 
But if we really want to know, we need to be trained. We need someone to sit down with us and say, here's how you share your faith. Here's what you do to help someone in their struggle. Here's how you can be a mentor to someone else. We're commanded again, as Paul talks to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, to be faithful in our work to God. That's why down in verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. We are called to pass our faithfulness on to others, to teach them, to share with them how they can live faithful lives and be discipling others as well. Discipleship equips us for this faithful Christian walk. So this morning, as we see how discipleship can benefit our Christian lives, we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we discipling anyone or are we being discipled? I, I can almost guarantee if I forced you to pick one or the other, if we had a sign up church program, sign up sheet right now, you can either sign up to disciple someone or be discipled. You had to pick one. The majority of us would write down, please send someone to disciple me. I need discipleship. Someone teach me how to grow in my faith. The majority of us immediately fall into that camp. I'm not ready to teach anybody, but if someone will teach me. There are some people who need that discipleship right now, but the vast majority of you in here raised your hand and said you've been believers for 10 years or longer. It's not time for you to continue being fed. It's time for you to start doing the feeding. It's time for you to start investing in other people. So this morning, I I hope and I encourage you to find someone who who will disciple you and who will mentor you. Maybe a a friend in Christ who you get together and just peer-to-peer share what God is doing in your life. I pray you would look for someone who you can invest in, who you can grab and say, are you meeting with anyone? Would you like to come to my house once a week? Would you like to meet at Hardy's once a week? Would you like to grab lunch or breakfast once a week? I have resources, and you can see me, resources that are wonderful. That has a 13-week uh, new life in Christ material that just goes over the basics of what the Christian faith is. It is excellent to take someone through and disciple. I'd be happy to share that with you and give you that resource in your hand. You can say, for 13 weeks, will you sit down with me and go through this together? Maybe you just want to sit down and say, let's read through this book of the Bible together. Hit a chapter or a chapter a day or a chapter a week, and let's just talk about how God is, is leading us through this book of the Bible. Maybe you want to invest in someone younger than you. Maybe you want to invest in someone older than you. Maybe you need to invest in someone who is a peer to you. But we all need to be discipling or being discipled by someone, and possibly both. I want you to ask the question this morning, am I a disciple or am I a mentor to someone? Am I fulfilling what Paul commands us in 2 Timothy to teach and to pass on what I've learned and what I already know? Maybe this morning you're still trying to figure out what this first definition of discipleship is. This discipleship of Jesus Christ, someone who is following Christ faithfully. You don't even know how to be a disciple to another individual because you've never submitted your life to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. This morning, I would love to share with you how you can know Christ. And I'd love to find someone, myself or someone else, who can teach you about the Christian faith and how to grow in that Christian faith so that you can be discipling others as well. But the first step is recognizing your need for salvation in Christ to begin with. This morning as we conclude our message, I want us to ask ourselves, who are we discipling? Who are we investing in? And how is God going to use that to grow our faith? Let's pray together. Father, I pray this morning that you would burden our hearts not to continue to be fed, but to start feeding. Lord, there are some in here this morning who need to be fed need some spiritual guidance or they need to be discipled and they're not ready to disciple someone else or the vast majority of our congregation this morning knows the Christian faith has lived the Christian faith and needs to pass that on to someone else 
Lord, the first step in being a disciple is recognizing our our need for salvation. And I pray this morning that each of us would examine our own hearts and see our need for salvation through Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of our sins, for submission for you to lead us. Lord, I pray that as we submit to you, then we would start to look how we can grow, how we can humble ourselves, how we can invest in others, and how we can share with others the love of Christ. Lord, as we think about discipleship this morning, give us a burden to invest in others. It's in your name we pray. Amen.